Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. The Prime Minister was grilled today in Ottawa over the government's response to the growing demonstrations and barricades across the country. Jamie Pasha Gumscum has more. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh asked the Prime Minister why he's dragging his feet and not getting closely involved in negotiations with Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. Now, Indigenous leaders, business leaders have all asked that this Prime Minister meet with the hereditary chiefs. For some reason, the Prime Minister doesn't get it. Now, this whole crisis could have been avoided if over a month ago the Prime Minister just met with the hereditary chiefs when they asked for it. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller said he's positive progress is being made with the Wet'suwet'en people. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett says she's optimistically awaiting results from a meeting between the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. Um, they, uh, they organized two days of meetings and uh, we hope that uh, this afternoon we will be able to hear back from them. For now, Public Safety Minister Bill Blair is asking for the demonstrations in Tyndanaga to cease. I think, I think that's terribly unsafe and, and, and inappropriate. Uh, but again, we, we have uh, the police of jurisdiction and are, are managing that, and that's their responsibility. I, I would, again, continue to urge people to, to take the barricades down, to obey the law, and, and encourage the dialogue that we know is so important to continue. But the demonstrations and blockades across the country, like the trains running through Tyendinaga Mohawk territory, show no signs of slowing down. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. Monday's arrests in Tyendinaga have not de-escalated the situation on the ground in the Mohawk community. Today, demonstrators in Ontario Provincial Police faced off on opposite sides of the railway tracks. Despite opposition from Mohawk, several trains passed through their territory. Demonstrators lined the tracks with pallets and tried to set fire to them. At one point, threw rocks at a moving train that forged through, despite demonstrators standing directly in front of it. Here's part of that scene as live streamed on social media. Jesus. An OPP spokesperson told APTN this afternoon that the individuals involved could face charges. CN did not respond to our request for comment. And in Quebec, warriors show no sign of abandoning their railway and road blockades erected in two Mohawk communities, despite ongoing developments in their sister community of Tyendinaga. Lindsay Richardson with more. CP Rail wants them out, but they say they're not ready to leave just yet. That's why overnight this group of Mohawk warriors in Ganawage, Mohawk territory, just south of Montreal, began the work of reinforcing a barricade that runs parallel to the CP freight tracks by dumping gravel and installing concrete barricades to slow traffic. Now they're awaiting the possible enforcement of an injunction order that was granted to CP just yesterday, one that local authorities say that they're going to be disregarding at least for now. To begin, the Mohawk Council of Ganawage says they don't recognize the Quebec court-issued injunction against the land defenders who have held vigil at this site for over two weeks and is even considering challenging the injunction, which Grand Chief Joe Norton called a confrontational tactic in a statement, adding that, quote, no one here will do Trudeau's dirty work. The expectation is that local police force, the Ganawage peacekeepers, will be the ones to enforce the injunction and clear interference from the site. But for now, Officer Kyle Zachary says they have no plans to give walking orders or criminalize people for standing up for their rights. For now, the peacekeepers, uh, we're going to continue what we've been doing, which is monitoring the site and ensuring that everybody on scene is safe and maintaining our uh, territorial integrity. For their part, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy said in a statement that, quote, coercive state-sponsored force is the wrong way to make peace. Kenneth Deer, secretary for the Mohawk Nation at Ganawage, says most of the tension can be attributed to media outlets referring to the ongoing blockades as fortifications, amplifying speculation about an upcoming standoff. There's no armaments, there's no arms or anything like that, you know. It's just, uh, it's just making the, the roadways uh, narrower. And, uh, and that's all that's necessary. 
Meanwhile, in the sister community of Ganazadage, community members are still demonstrating, slowing traffic to one lane on a main thoroughfare. We're going to keep it peaceful until need be. <laughs> While the consensus seems to be that someone or something has to give, Mohawk communities in Quebec insist it won't be them. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Ganawage, Mohawk Territory. Meanwhile, earlier today, Quebec Premier Francois Legault alleged a so-called good source warned him that some in Ganawage are heavily armed and prepared to injure intervening officers from the provincial police force. In a statement, Kenneth Deer called Legault's remarks dangerous and inflammatory, saying the blockade is peaceful. We go now to the Mi'kmaq community of Listagooch in Quebec's Gaspé region, where several people have been camped out alongside a railroad for almost three weeks. But a new court injunction initiated by the province means they too now face the possibility of arrests. Angel Moore reports from Listagooch. Uh, Listagush community members have been here since February 10th. They are camped by this railroad in solidarity with, with Wet'suwet'en. They were served an injunction and they have 10 days to clear this site. Earlier today I spoke with Gary Metallic Sr. about the injunction and this is what he had to say. You know, we're just claiming what we rightfully owe. We're not trespassers. Nobody's a trespasser. Every, every one of those blockades, no one is a trespasser. The trespassers are the federal and provincial governments. When I was here earlier today, the lumber mill just up the road dropped off firewood for the campsite. GDS Forestries have been supplying firewood the entire time. Company representative Steve LeBlanc said in an email statement, in a neighborly spirit of collaboration that we have maintained with the community for 30 years and more, we answered the, the request to provide firewood. April Isaac has been at the site since the start, and this is how she feels about what's going on and what's going to happen. For everybody else out there on the front lines, stay strong, stand strong, don't back down. We all, all we got is each other. For now, people are waiting to see what's going to happen next. Apparently, more people are on the way in support of the Wet'suwet'en Solidarity. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Listagush, Quebec. Winnipeggers woke up Wednesday morning to find three well-known public landmarks spray-painted by persons unknown. The building and statue of a Mountie at the RCMP D Division headquarters on Portage Avenue were spray-painted with derogatory terms. So was Federal Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandell's office in St. Boniface and the Canadian Human Rights Museum near the Forks. Cleanup efforts are underway. In a statement, Vandell said, quote, I recognize recent events across the country are concerning for all Canadians. However, acts of vandalism like this are not the answer. Dialogue is needed. Indigenous youth protesters showed their support for the Wet'suwet'en opposition to the coastal gasoline project in northern BC today. Standing on the steps of the British Columbia Legislature, activists explained what they plan to do. The world witnessed Indigenous matriarchs, Wet'suwet'en matriarchs, be ripped from their place of ceremony and honoring missing and murdered Indigenous women and be arrested in the name of a piece of paper, in the name of an injunction that prioritizes the profit of a pipeline over Indigenous livelihoods. We saw reconciliation, a colonial facade that Canada has never never fulfilled, come crashing down on that day. The Youth Coalition is on the third day of an occupation at the BC Legislature in Victoria. Well, today on In Focus, we discuss the Wet'suwet'en conflict over the CGL pipeline and the solidarity actions and blockades that have been happening across Canada. Our panel weighs in on the Indigenous laws that are cited for Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief's refusal to let the pipeline through. Indigenous laws are so important for the fact that they're higher laws that they're higher laws than any law that has ever been imposed on us, and they need to be respected. Uh, Mr. Wilton, we'll, we'll go to you with first. The Mohawks down here, it's been our 
it, that's been our platform for since <laughs> since before contact that we're an independent nation we have our own laws our own institutions our own our own way of doing things and yet that was shoved aside when the indian act and the colonial system came in and we still maintain that we have uh, inherent rights uh, over traditional territories the the band councils may be able to rule the roost on the reserves but we have much broader aims as far as traditional people are concerned. Yes, I'm talking as a traditional person and a journalist. Mr. Ross? The question was, uh, where in the Delgamo court case does it say hereditary chiefs hold jurisdiction on rights and title versus the Indian Act, elected chief and counsel? And the thing about it is that case law around Aboriginal rights and title only rules on principles. And it's not just Delgamu. You can't just take Delgamu and just uh, take the, the, the decision and apply that the Aboriginal rights tile across the board. You got to read it in, in a concert with Haida, Mikasu Cree, Gladstone, and all these other court cases. And if, even if that was true, even if it was true, because that principle has, has never come up in Delgamu, but even if that was true, how do you reconcile that with another principle of case law that says Aboriginal rights of title is a communal right? meaning it belongs to the community. So that, that, that's contradicting the whole nature of Aboriginal rights and title. And you can catch that whole episode of In Focus over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Time for a quick break, but still to come, a profile of a Highland Nation man helping others in Vancouver's downtown east side. Here's a look at Thursday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Plus two with the rain-snow mix in Halifax. Minus one for St. John's. Sunny and 18 below in Nain. Minus 26 under sunny skies in Inukshuaq. Zero with snow in Montreal. Minus four and a rain-snow mix for Saguenay. Minus three and a rain-snow mix in Toronto. Seven below for Ottawa. Minus nine in Thunder Bay. Sunny and 11 below in Sioux Lookout. 17 below for Churchill, minus 9 in Thompson and Norway House. 10 below with snow for Winnipeg, minus 2 in Brandon. Plus 1 for North Battleford and Saskatoon, 6 above under sunny skies and swift current. Plus 1 in Meadow Lake, minus 2 in La Ronde. Welcome back to Nunavut now, where the Legislative Assembly chose a new speaker today after the current one resigned to care for an ailing family member. And who they chose is familiar to anyone who follows Nunavut politics. Paul Casa helped negotiate the Nunavut land claim, was first elected MLA in 2013, and served as Premier for eight months in 2017-2018. He was voted out of the Premier's job in 2018, but stayed on as an MLA. Now in a secret ballot, the same MLAs who didn't want Casa as Premier picked him for Speaker. As is tradition, his colleagues hauled him to the Speaker's chair, where he thanked the members before starting the business of the day. I pledge to uphold the traditions of your legislature and I assure you that this institution will remain a welcoming place that reflects and respects all of our territory's people. To the Ontario legislature now, where three Indigenous members of provincial parliament abstain from entering the legislature until more than 120 of their colleagues finished singing God Save the Queen on Monday. An initiative of the Doug Ford government passed late last year will see the royal anthem sung in the legislature the first Monday of every month. MPPs returned to the legislature for the first Monday of February just this week. MPP Saul Mamakwa was one of three NDP MPPs who did not enter the chamber until it was done. 
And I think that's where I stand in with this issue and uh, with this anthem, you know, bring bring this back into uh, on a monthly basis uh, to this place. Uh, you know, it's that's not reconciliation. It's again, it's a step backwards, and it's just uh, you know when we talk about oppression, when we talk about discrimination, when we talk about racism, that's what this exists for, and then we cannot continue to support. Uh, you know, for me as a First Nations person, as a uh, a member of Province Parliament, I cannot support that. Vancouver's downtown east side has a reputation as a neighborhood where addiction and poverty is a common sight. But now one man is on a personal mission to help make a change for the people that live there. APTN's Tina House has that story. When James Harry walks through these alleys where open drug use is rampant, he doesn't see hopelessness, but rather potential and an opportunity to heal those that are suffering. I know how they're hurting. I know why they're hurting. I know that a lot of these people down here are running. They're running from the traumas, they're running from their hurts, right? And that's what we're trying to stop. James is an outreach worker employed by his community, the Heisler Nation. He has an office at the Friendship Center and works with a team that helps Indigenous people to find housing and to heal from addictions and abuse. His main focus is to help other Heisler Nation members get into detox a healing center and then eventually return home to get reconnected to their families and culture. Edwin Foe is one of those success stories. He spent over 30 years drinking anything with alcohol in it until that one day he met James three years ago. Uh, I changed my life when he asked me if I wanted to get clean and sober and I said that's the first that was the first attempt. Uh, when I, then I relapsed, and then I went back to Kitimat, and then now where I'm at now, James has played a big role. He saved my life, actually. The initiative was started by Heisla Band Councillor Kevin Stewart when his own family member was lost on these streets, plagued by addiction issues. We want our people to come back home and connect with their culture and their land, because that's what our people did in the past. That's what made us well. and and made us uh, understand that we need each other to move forward in our cultural ways and the connection to our land, which is important to our na all our nations. James Harry knows the reality of addiction all too well. He spent a few years down here himself, heavily addicted and hurting from the trauma of being an intergenerational residential school survivor. He says those were dark days, but after coming off of one particular seven-day binge, he had an epiphany that he deserved better, and he got into treatment. It's a beautiful thing when you see when you see fi somebody find that spark, find that life that they they've lost. It's amazing, yeah, it, and that's that's my basically my mission. I want people to feel how I feel today. Other First Nations communities are now emulating the success of this program, hiring their own outreach workers to help their own members. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. That's an amazing job, James. And if you want to weigh in on the role James is playing or any other story, here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. Still to come, a new production on a notorious residential school. Here's the rest of Thursday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta. Plus 5 for Grand Prairie and Peace River, one above in high level. Plus 6 under sunny skies for Medicine Hat, 11 above in Lethbridge. 11 in Victoria, plus 10 with showers for Vancouver. 0 in Fort Nelson, 6 with showers in Smithers. Minus 22 in Old Crow, 3 below with snow for Whitehorse. Minus 9 in Fort Liard and Trout Lake, snow and 12 below in Yellowknife. Minus 29 for Saks Harbor, 26 below for Pulatuck, 26 below in Repulse Bay, minus 28 for Cambridge Bay, 30 below for Resolute, Joe Haven, and Aglulik.
Welcome back. A dance piece exploring the lives and spirits of children forced to attend the oldest residential school in Canada is showing in Winnipeg. The mush hole is set at Ontario's Mohawk Institute. As Brittany Hobson shows us, it was a project years in the making. Testimony from residential school survivors is translated into movement for a production called The Mush Hole. The title refers to the nickname of the Mohawk Institute Residential School in Ontario. Mush was the so-called food Indigenous kids were fed day after day. Six Nations artist Santi Smith is a creator and producer of the piece. When I was growing up, I heard, the, I heard about the mush hole. I had no context, no understanding about what that was, other than to know that it was not a good place. Many children from Six Nations were forcibly sent to the Institute, including Smith's grandfather and great-grandmother. Smith began developing the piece in 2016 when she took part in a workshop held at the site, which now operates as a Woodland Cultural Centre. So a lot of my work is land-based and site-based to be actually in the land, in the building, um, acknowledging where we are and that history that is rooted in the ground, in the walls, the DNA that's left in, in, the, in the, um, the walls. The piece is set in between the 1930s and 1950s and touches on themes of colonialism and assimilation. The crosses, the broken crosses and the dismantling and the breaking of them and trying to put them back together is, um, is really, you know, that um, Christianity was imposed on, on the students and that struggle to um, loss of identity, um, assimilated into um, a culture and a belief that is not um, coming from your indigenous um, sense or your indigenous person. To prepare, the cast went over interviews and writing from residential school survivors. Montana Summers has been part of the production since the beginning. Yeah, I don't think I've ever done anything that could compare to this. Though the piece explores the cruel realities Indigenous kids faced, it is ultimately a story of honouring and healing. We always want to represent our resilience and that's why I like to take away from this is showing so much resilience and that we can still move forward even though how heavy this truth is we can still move forward with it. Mushhole is showing at the Manitoba Theatre for Young People until February 29th. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Powerful looking production. Well that's all the time we have for this Wednesday. For much more visit our website aptnnews.ca. That's where you can also watch today's episode of In Focus on the Wet'suwet'en Conflict and Solidarity Actions. And we leave you tonight with one of those actions happening a short while ago at Winnipeg's iconic Portage in Maine where a counter-protester was also on hand. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.